Welcome to Gospel Life Church. But does Gospel Life Church cease to exist when we're not gathered? So how do I say welcome to Gospel Life Church? I guess I say welcome to the building. But uh, welcome to the gathering of Gospel Life Church. How about that? Uh, praise God for, for springtime. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, snow on the ground last week. This week, beautiful sunshine. Trees, flowers are, are starting to bud. Now, let me ask you a, a, a basic question, kind of launching off what we did last week. What is the mission of the church? What is the mission of the church? Now, as, as you, you have to answer this question, because if I ask you a question, even internally, you're, you're already answering it right now, aren't you? Or you have a lot of question marks in your mind. Question mark, question mark, question mark. What is the mission of the church? You're asking yourself the question. Can you state that in a sentence? What is it? What is the prime? So how would we answer that question? Um, let me ask this. Raise your hand if you pretty much have a, a pretty strong idea about what the mission, the, just the, in one sentence, what the mission of the church is. Raise your hand. Okay. Um, would you mind if, you, if you're like, ah, I'm kind of uh, murky on that. It's it, it maybe gray area. I, I'm not quite sure. I need more clarity. Would you raise your hand? And it's harder to raise your hand when you're saying, admitting you don't know. <laughs> but uh, we want to talk about that this morning because, you know, we've been talking, we, we're coming off this, this kind of series where we're talking about the uh, ministry and using our spiritual gifts one to another. And that's hugely important. But the question that really begs is, why is that important? Is that a peripheral thing? Is using our gifts, exercising our gifts one with another, is that an optional thing? Now, you know that banner we have at the top of the stairs out there? The 31 another statements? The 31 another commands? The 31 another imperatives? Are those optional? How does that fit in with answering the question of what is the mission of the church? I could say, I like to say this, getting ahead of myself, but those 31 another's in some sense are equivalent to the 613 commands given to the nation of Israel at Sinai. For us, that's, those are our commands. So even there you start to see it's not, it's not an optional thing if we're going to be called out, um, if we're going to live out the mission that Jesus has given us. Now, some of us may have answered this way. I'm just going to kind of answer. Um, the mission of the church is to give the gospel. Now, no one's going to argue with me on that, right? Now that, but I want to say further, there's a sense in which, hear me, that to state the mission of the church in that way is, is, a, uh, is limiting the mission of the church. In some sense, I could say if the mission of the church is merely to give the gospel, we could take that and hear that in some sense as a reduction of what the mission of the church actually is. And does that sound heretical? I'm just not saying that that's not the mission of the church. But, I'm not, but I am saying that that's not all the mission of the church is. And if we don't fully understand what the mission of the church, there's so many things that are crucial to us living out the gospel that get put on the shelf of optional. Optional. Now, how would we answer this question, what the mission of the church is? Not rhetorical. What, how would we do that? Scripture. Can't go wrong there, right? Would we agree with that? Or should we just come up with the mission of our own imagination and just stamp New Testament on it? No. We, we would go to the Scripture. That's what we want to do today in answering this question. So I want to look through some Scripture. And I just, I don't know if you've noticed in your Bible reading, how, where, does, um, where do the gospel writers and where does Paul and all his epistles to the church, where do they spend the bulk of their time? Where do they spend the bulk of their time? Because the tendency is if we don't take all these things together, um, we don't really realize the full magnitude of what we're called to do. We don't realize the full magnitude. And what further can happen is we reduce the New Testament to a moral code. Just a moral code. These are things that you're supposed to do. These are things you're not supposed to do. And is that what's happening in the New Testament? Now, clearly there is a, in some sense, a moral code there. But is all, that's all that's happening? Or does that moral code, if you want to call it that, is that connected with a much bigger purpose of what we're called to do with reference to the mission of the church? 
So you see, if we don't see this moral code in light of or under the umbrella of what our mission is, then it just becomes a list of do's and don'ts. And you're good if you do them, and you're bad if you don't. Versus, hey, I, I have desire, I want to reflect out, I want to fulfill God's overarching purpose for us. Now, Cliff mentioned this in his prayer, or in his, when, when he said earlier, he said Jesus got it right for us, didn't he? Yes, he did. Now, hallelujah. He got it right for us. Yes, that's the gospel, that's the good news, right? Jesus stood in our place. But we, we have to say, and let me spend some time here, we have to understand that statement, what that, the full magnitude of, of that statement in the context of the overarching storyline of the scripture. When we say Jesus got it right, there's a sense in which if you place that in, into the storyline of scripture, we realize there, those that came before Jesus didn't get it right. Amen. Jesus in his ministry is the new Israel. Initiating the new exodus. Creating the new covenant as a reflection of the new creation. Now, anytime I say there's something new, you have to ask yourself, in new in reference to what? There's, if there's something new, 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 what's the old? Israel. Israel was called to be the people of God. Israel was promised an inheritance. Israel was promised to be blessed, that through them all the nations of the earth would be blessed, and that they would inherit land. Now, those promises all fall underneath this, this man, perhaps you've heard of him, Father Abraham, right? Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so were you. So let's just praise the Lord. Okay, do, we, do you guys remember that song? Perhaps if you didn't grow up in Sunday school, you may not remember. I remember that song, clearly. I didn't have to look at a lyric. How is it that we are children of Abraham? Is that just, there's actually some good theology there. But are we Israelites? Are we genealogically connected back to, is our forefather ethnically, genealogically Abraham? No. Now, there's this thing called the Abrahamic covenant. There's multiple covenants in, your, in the Bible. I said there's a new covenant, I already mentioned that, and, and Jesus initiated that. It's prophesied in the Old Testament in, in, in very crucial passages like uh, Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 31. Those are two of the prominent uh, prophecies of this new covenant. But there's also the Mosaic covenant, the covenant God made with Moses and Israel. There's the Davidic covenant. There's the covenant that God made with King David. And even before that, there's, there's the Abrahamic covenant. There's actually a covenant God made with Noah as well. And there's a few others. But this, I want to draw attention to this, the, the covenant God made with Abraham for a second. You see, and I mentioned this before, and I want to repeat it just for, for sake of teaching, so this can just become normal in, in our heart, uh, long-term memories, but you have all this negative, bad stuff happening in the first 11 chapters of the Bible, don't you? The fall. Then you have a flood. And then you have the Tower of Babel. And just a lot of bad stuff. And there's a lot of, um, there's a thousand years of history there, if, if not more. And then all of a sudden, the, the, the writer of Genesis slows down and changes gears in Genesis chapter 12, doesn't he? And the way he does that is we encounter this man, Abram, whose, whose name will later become Abraham. And God comes to Abram, and he calls him out of where he's living. And he makes these promises to him that we just mentioned. He promises to bless him, that through his lineage, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And he promises to give him a land. Now, this Abrahamic covenant, as we call it, is repeated multiple times in that storyline. It's in Genesis 12, it's in Genesis 15, Genesis 17, and Genesis 22, where we get different aspects of the same covenant. Now, the original mention of land uh, promised to Abraham is what? It's from Egypt to the Euphrates River. Is that all? Do we see that, that um, 
that storyline with the Abrahamic covenant, do we see that as relevant to us at all today? Is my question. Because we see all that the, the, the nation of Israel was, was called out to be on mission to the surrounding nations, and they, they got it wrong, didn't they? They got it wrong. They started living, they started worshiping false gods. They weren't children of God. Children look like their father. Uh, they were really children of the surrounding pagan nations. And then not only that, as we said before, they, they started to see themselves as better than the other people. So they took the fact that God called them to be the people of God as an excuse to put themselves on a pedestal so they can say they're better than other people. And then they failed in that mission. But here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus. And if you want to do some Bible study this week, because I know we like to study the Bible, have you ever noticed in the book of Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, this word fulfilled, plerao, fulfilled. It, it, it begins early on in the book of Matthew, and it says that Jesus fulfilled this, he fulfilled that, he fulfilled this. Now, if you look at our tendency, if we just read Matthew, say Jesus fulfilled, we say, oh, Jesus this is the fulfillment of what? A prophecy. Because that's kind of what the gospel writer says. He's, this is fulfilled, was prophesied in the book of. But you know what? Here's the thing. The Bible's actually deeper than that. Because if you go back and you look at those prophecies in the Old Testament that Jesus is said to fulfill, it's in some sense apples and oranges. In fact, some of those prophecies, like for instance, uh, the children at Bethlehem being murdered by Herod. If you look back and say this is fulfilled what was prophesied, um, the Old Testament prophet did not prophesy that babies in Bethlehem would be murdered. What, what, so what, I ask you, what's happening there? This word fulfill is, is doing one thing. It's saying, look it, Jesus is the new Israel. All these things that Israel did and failed at, now Jesus is picking up that storyline, doing similar things. So we say that's not a, a, a direct fulfillment. We would call these this big fancy word called analogical fulfillment. To say that this fulfillment is like, that's what analogy means. This fulfillment is like what we find, the pattern that we find in the Old Testament. Now why is that all happening? Jesus was driven out into the wilderness for how many days? 40 days in the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry. What is that like? What is that analogically fulfilling? What is that like? It's like the children of Israel being driven out into the wilderness for 40 years. So Jesus, there's, there's just so many ways. I can't get into, into them all this morning. But there are so many ways in which we, we um, that Jesus on into the church is picking up this storyline from the Old Testament. And moving forward. And in order for us to fully fulfill, understand what the mission of the church is, it, it helps a lot to understand how the church is connected with the overarching storyline, going back to Israel, before that Adam, uh, Abraham, before that even Adam. Because we realize, as I said before, that Abraham was really picking up the storyline in the Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden had all those essential properties, essential elements. There was a land there, and there was blessing. There was fellowship with God, wasn't there? And they were kicked out of the land. They were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, weren't they? They were kicked out of having access to the way of eternal life, to the access to the tree of life. And what happened when Israel failed? What were they, were they also, weren't they also kicked out of their land? You see? So there's just so many ways, can't get into them all now, but that, that Jesus, what he's doing with the church is picking up that Old Testament storyline. And the and one of the ways we could summarize all that he's doing was doing in Adam and Abraham and Israel and in, in Jesus on into the church and on into the coming kingdom, which the church is to be a reflection of, is that I could summarize all that by saying God from the beginning, from day one, has, has been in the, the, ha, his mission has been to form a people. To form a people. See, now we're getting close to answering our question what the mission of the church is. And that's why when Cliff says Jesus got it right, often what we find so frequently in the scriptures and Paul's letters is he's making, and they're not always explicit, so you may not pick it up, especially if you don't have a Bible with, with references in it. But in so many of the things he's saying, he's referring to Israel. 
He's referring to Old Testament passages. And basically what Paul is saying is, is, hey, as a church, as the new Israel, because the church is called the new Israel in Galatians 6, as the new Israel, let's get it right this time. Now, what is the primary difference between us as the church and Israel? What have we been given as a down payment, as a guarantee, as the fulfillment of our mission, and as a guarantee as the fulfillment of the coming kingdom? What is it? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And that's what the new covenant is all about. Those who are in the new covenant have the Holy Spirit of God. That is, God has changed their very nature to guarantee that they will continue on on their mission. Was everybody who was in the nation of Israel automatically have the indwelling Holy Spirit? Not everybody did. And so them offering sacrifices, you know what it was often like? You know what I liken it to? It was like they're paying their traffic tickets. They were just, they were offering sacrifices so they could be in right standing, but their heart was not in it, was was it? It was merely religion. And that's why we find places where God says, I hate your sacrifices. Because he realizes he has a people, but their heart is not in it. They're doing it so they can be in right standing within the theocracy or the the covenant community. They're doing it so that they don't get, you know, experience the curses that have been promised upon them. But uh, eventually, God looks down on it because God does look at the heart and he says, you know what? You offer these sacrifices, but your heart's not in it. And so they're detestable things to me. What does everybody within the new covenant community have? They have the Holy Spirit of God that gives them this desire to please God. And that's what I want to appeal to this morning. Now, read those passages in Matthew. I don't have time to get them. And look up. For instance, look at Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, in in reference to Matthew chapter 2. Um, There's some great study there. It'll cause you to ask some questions that can be answered, but we see that Jesus is He's, he's uh, reenacting the history of Israel because it's not just important that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. That's only half of the gospel. What's equally important is that Jesus lived out the perfect, righteous life that we are called to live. God's not satisfied with just our, us not sinning or he's not satisfied with just our sins being taken out of the way. He also demands perfect righteousness. That is to say, he also demands, because of his holiness, demands that we live out a life of perfect righteousness. It's not just about not sinning. It's also about doing the right thing, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, 24-7 all the time. Now, have any of us done that? And so do you see why, how it's so crucial that not only is Jesus' death and resurrection important for us, but it's also vitally important that his life is important for us because he lived the life that God requires. And now, those who are having received the new nature, the Holy Spirit in us, we desire to live out a life that looks like Jesus. And just a little foreshadowing now, we desire to live a life as citizens of heaven. As citizens of heaven. Now let me give you an example going back to our original question. Please bear with me. I know a little teaching this morning, a little theology, but if you're excited about understanding your Bible, these themes that I'm mentioning are crucial to you putting your whole Bible together. They're not just some peripheral topics. These are the main themes that I'm bringing up this morning, just so you know. They're not peripheral, and so we should be uh, vitally uh, interested in understanding these things if we want to understand our Bible. For example, in in preparing this message, I had to go through Matthew. I had to go through... uh, a lot of Romans. I had to go through all of Philippians. I had to go through all of Ephesians. I had to go back to, to uh, huge passages in Isaiah. I had to go back to uh, a huge narrative section in, in Genesis because, again, these are the major themes of Scripture, not peripheral. Now, in answering our question, let's go to Matthew 28. You guys heard of the Great Commission, right? The Great Commission passage. What does commission mean? Yes. It means together on mission, together. Now, can you do mission solo? Not the way the Bible describes it. Can't. Notice I said citizens of heaven. I didn't say citizen of heaven, did I? Plural. So the great commission means together on mission. Now, I, I want to argue in, in, in answering this question, what is the mission of the church? I want to say that we've taken this great commission passage, which I'm going to read in a moment, and we've emphasized one thing and kind of neglected another thing. But I want you to be so clear this morning 
please, Lord, help me on this to understand what our mission is. And if you, unless you think I'm being heretical when I say the, the mission of the church is more than just giving the gospel, it's more than that. It's not less, but it's more. The main mission, I want to go back to the words of Jesus. Here we find it. The last thing Jesus says at the end of Matthew, Jesus, we rec- in verse 18, Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's the Great Commission. If you don't have that memorized, great passage to memorize. Go ye therefore and make disciples. Now here's what I want to argue. In, in oftentimes in, in my training and in my upbringing, the, the part that was emphasized about this text is the what? The go ye therefore and make disciples. Go ye therefore and make disciples. And that's vitally important. But notice what he says further. How do we make these disciples? What are we going to do with these new disciples? Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. It is crucially important for the church to fulfill its mission that that, um, we live out all that Jesus modeled and taught us. All throughout his ministry, Jesus is doing things with these disciples to show us what the church is going to look like. Jesus spends time washing his disciples' feet. We, too, should be washing each other's feet with how we treat each other. Now, I had a seminary professor, and uh, just really briefly, just give an illustration of where I'm coming from. I had a seminary professor, um, he was talking about, it was a church history class, and he was talking about what the mission, I've said this before, he was talking about what the, the mission of the church is. And he said, you know, you got all these young guys who are talking about you know, redeeming the culture and the good Samaritan and the, and I stopped him right there and I said, wait a minute. Aren't we supposed to be as pastors teaching the good Samaritan? I mean, we, redeeming the culture, that's debatable, right? But good Samaritan, that's Bible, isn't it? So I asked him the question, um, raised my hand. I said, do you think that the good Samaritan passage is part of the all things whatsoever I've commanded you, do you think the Good Samaritan is part of the all things of the Great Commission? Now, obvious question, obvious answer. And he says, no, I don't think that it is. Quote, unquote. Why is that? How could my seminary professor has a PhD towards the end of his career, been teaching many years, how could he ever possibly say that the Good Samaritan passage is not part of the all things of the Great Commission passage? Because the emphasis in the church has been, in some sense, we are to preach the gospel or proclaim the gospel, and that's all we really need to do. And all those other things in the gospels, that was before Acts 2. That was before the Pentecost. Those things aren't for the church. That was for Israel. That's how. Now, is that what's happening? Do we draw a a line between the mission of Israel and the mission of the church, or is there some overlap and progression? So, teaching these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, the commands he's given us, in fulfilling those, in living those out, we are modeling the coming kingdom, and we are living as a new covenant community. New covenant and reference to the old. So that some, there's some things that are new about the new covenant, obviously, and there's some things that are similar and have o- overlap with the old covenant. So Jesus does all these things to teach us, to show us what it means to live out being the people of God. So here's how I state it. Our mission is to give the gospel, to herald the gospel, to proclaim the gospel. But it's more than that. It's to live out the gospel. Do you see the difference? To live out the gospel includes so much more than just proclaiming the gospel. 
Because see, if it's just to proclaim the gospel, we can give the gospel inside this church building at this address every Sunday. But we won't be shining as bright lights out there in the world on mission. We can live our, 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 uh, our faith out in, as individuals in isolation of any community as long as when someone, the Holy Spirit happens to bring someone across our path, we give them a gospel tract. That's really all that's required. But we wouldn't be observing all the things that Jesus has commanded us, would we? Trust me, if you're living as a citizen of heaven, are you going to give the gospel every chance you get? Absolutely. But here's what I want to say. The mission of the church, simply stated, is to live out the gospel. Which includes so much more. So if you understand that, you see why G the gospels and Paul's epistles spend so much time where they do because he's only ever teaching us what it means to live out the gospel in a gospel community as the new covenant, new creation, people of God. That's why I say you cannot do the Christian life alone. And if we will do this, all the aches and all the pain and all the fears and all the issues we have, all those things are included. Those needs are being fulfilled and met in the mission Jesus has called us to. For instance, can I give you an example? Some of us have had a, a troubled, trial, uh, horrific past, right? The way we were brought up, we had some horrific things happen to us, right? And as a result of that, we can live a life of we began living a life of shame. And we thought little of ourselves. And the way that people devalued became our estimation of our own value. Correct? Isn't this a pattern we see? Because we see ourselves through the lens of those who raised us in our formative years, for instance. And those things, those values, or lack of values, I should say, are so deeply embedded in us that we can't even see them. They're just normal to us, and we carry these burdens and this baggage around with us. And you know how we move away from shame? We move away from shame by moving into vulnerability. We move away from shame by moving into vulnerability. And you know what that is? That the gospel, lived out the gospel, means to, that we have transparency and vulnerability without rejection. We have transparency with each other, vulnerability with each other, without rejection. Because any time in the past, for instance, we let, we've been raised this way, any time we were burying our souls, burying our hearts, we were transparent. When we were vulnerable, we didn't, we, all we got was rejection. And so we said, you know what? I got to do it alone. I got to go it alone. I have to, I can't expose the, 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 the core of who I am, because every time I have, I've been rejected. I've been criticized. I've been judged. Do you see why we have community groups? So if, this is just one instance for, for the first time in someone's life, they can come into a gospel community, and through other people, by confessing their sins one to another, by praying for each other, by talking about the deepest, darkest parts of ourselves, for the first time, we encounter not rejection, but the love of the gospel. Because when we accept each other that way, that is the gospel. Why? Because is that not what Jesus did for us? In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us? He saw us. He did not reject us. He was, we were transparent with him because he is the God who sees the heart. We cannot be anything less than transparent with him. We can deceive ourselves, but we won't deceive him. And yet he sees all the worst parts of us and he embraces us. And he finds a way to, for the Father to embrace us by getting up on a cross and giving us the perfect life of righteousness and taking upon ourselves, himself the shame and the uh, punishment and the wrath of God. And that's the gospel. Jesus stood in our place. So those of us who have understood the gospel says, says you know, I, I need to not only proclaim the gospel, I need to live out the gospel. And do you see how we have, as a church, the opportunity to live out the gospel in every interaction we ever have? All throughout the week. 
and I could say especially with each other. Oh, for the day when we would, before we enter any conversation with any person, we would have the thought that Holy Spirit help me to live out what it means to be a citizen of heaven in this situation. That's why Paul says in Philippians, work out your own salvation. Does he mean, hey, work out your own salvation like, hey, try to earn it, do good works so you can get saved? Maybe. He's saying, live out in this context, in Philippi, in this Roman province, figure out, work through what it means to shine like light, as Daniel 12, 3 prophesies. Think through what it means to live out as a citizen of heaven in every context you're ever in. And I tell you, if you're living as a citizen of heaven, you are going to proclaim the gospel, but not just through your words, also through your deeds. And that's why it's so important. One of the reasons it's so important for us to live out the gospel, as we often say here, is it's not just what, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. In oftentimes, correct? Do you see why to, to, um, to say that the mission of a church is, is merely to proclaim through words, that's the whole mission of a church, that being a reduction, leads to or does not facilitate the mission that living out the gospel would? We will not be a hospital until we learn to embrace each other with transparency and vulnerability without rejection. Because we're all sinners. Shock. Newsflash, right? But what happens often in church? We, found, we find out the dirt on somebody. We either find out the dirt on somebody or we speculate with slander and gossip some dirt on somebody and we use that to reject them. Pastors can do this too. You're just not saved. We got to put them out of the church. And we heap shame upon shame instead of being a hospital. Now sometimes we do have to put people out of the church. The Bible's clear on that. Romans 16, 17, Titus 3, 10. Sometimes we do have to put people out, but I tell you, it's not for the purpose of ultimate rejection. The purpose is motivated by love. What is the mission of the church? It's to live out the gospel through every interaction, including to give the gospel as through proclamation. Now, I want to run through somewhat quickly, if you'd bear, me, uh, uh, bear with me, some scripture in Philippians, okay? And if you think that I moved too quickly, you might want to jot these references down. I will post the outline as a PDF um, with the sermon on our website. Um, when you understand what, what's just been said, you, you, you start to see why Paul is writing what he's writing. So I'm going to move quickly. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. Philippians 1, 9. And if you can't turn the Bible very quickly, just jot the reference down and then just listen with your full attention. Philippians 1.9. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. Didn't that just sound like a mission statement? We want to bring much glory and praise to God. And it's through our living out our righteous character, by living out the fruit of our salvation, by being overflowing with love. By the way, the love here is agape. Agape is an active love. It moves towards someone with love. It's not just happy thoughts. <laughs> Thinking happy thoughts about you. I'm loving you. No, it's, it's active love. And what does that active love look, look like? It looks like that list of 31 and other statements on that banner out there. You want to do a, a self-assessment if you're loving well? Go read those 31 and other statements and see if you're doing that well with each other. Philippians 127, we'll keep moving. Above all, Philippians 127. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, worthy of the good news about Christ. And of course, in chapter 3, verse 20, he mentions the concept of citizens of heaven again. And as I said, it says citizens of heaven, not citizen of heaven. Now, you imagine a person who goes to heaven. By the way, 
is our ultimate end going to heaven? We always talk about when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. Is that the ultimate end? The scripture, the culmination of scripture is we don't go to heaven, heaven comes to us. The new heaven and the new earth where heaven and earth become one place. So imagine you went to heaven, which is a temporary place actually because eventually it's coming to earth. All of God's majesty, all of uh, the full throne room of God. He will dwell on earth with his people as Emmanuel, God with us. That's our future. That's our hope. But imagine you went to heaven right now and you lived there for a moment. And then you came back to earth. Would that change the way you lived? If you are living as a citizen of, see, I think sometimes we look at that citizens of heaven and we just think, okay, I'm going to die and go to heaven. And I need to live as remembering that I'm going to heaven. And that's true. But ma- imagine what it would mean, the, this total shift in values to live as a citizen of heaven. Not a citizen of America, not just a Republican or a Democrat, but something that transcends those categories, a citizen of heaven. How, what would you do with your time, your talent, and your treasure? And would you be proclaiming to people the good news of the gospel? Would you be living out the gospel? Would you get caught up? Would you be uh, hung up on the baggage from your past? Would you be hung up on conflict where someone won't forgive you with bitterness? Would any of those things matter to us? What would matter is, I've, I've been in the throne room of God. And that is our future hope. And all these things don't matter. Heaven's coming. You know? conflict with somebody, opportunity to forgive. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't have to be caught up in the, ba- in the bitterness and in the shame and the guilt and all these things. Hallelujah, I've been redeemed. Amen. I've been made a citizen of heaven. Right. If this was our first thought, the glory of God as expressed through us, how would that completely transform our lives? But yet we hold on. We hold on to these other things that don't matter, that are temporary. We hold on to them. We hold on to our guilt, to our shame, to our baggage, to our bitterness. And we because we have our fists so tightly clenched, it's not open to receive blessings from God. And that's a lack of faith. And whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Because it cuts us off from being channels of his Holy Spirit to live as citizens of heaven in the world. I wonder how we would live. By the way, anything that you say, well, you know what, Um, that's not like a citizen of heaven. That's called sin. And now is this time to say, hey, I repent and I confess, and I'm going to stop doing that by the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to be that anymore. You ever tried to ask someone forgiveness, and all they wanted to do was remind you of the past, and they thought, I already know who you are. (laughs) You say you're repenting. I don't believe it. Do you think that about yourself? I've always had these struggles, and I'm always going to have those struggles. Do you believe that? Or can God do a work in your life even this year in 2016? Can you be moving forward more and more like into the image of Jesus Christ? Can you believe that your past doesn't have to determine your present because it's his past on the cross that determines our reality? Just because you've always had a certain struggle, you've always thought a certain way, doesn't mean you have to take that into the rest of 2016. And you're going to need to be around other people, encouraging people to remind you of that, to love you through that, to tell you when you're believing a lie, when you're allowing self-deception to take hold, to say, you know what, that's not true. That's not true. By the way, the strongest, the the strategy for coming out of self-deception is having another person that you trust more than yourself. And if you don't have another person that you trust more than yourself, you are vulnerable to self-deception. That's all I have time to say about that. Ephesians 2, 19, if we were to switch back to the text that we've been going through, he mentions this again. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. He's saying the same thing there in in Ephesians 2, 19 that he just said in Philippians 1, 27. By the way, justification by faith alone, through Christ alone, that reconciles us, we have to remember, that reconciles us with God. But we often forget that that also reconciles us with each other. With each other. 
You are not, you, when you are made a citizen of heaven, you are adopted into the family. By default, that means you have brothers and sisters now. Amen. So let's treat each other like brothers and sisters, like citizens of heaven. Philippians 3.3. 3. I'm going to skip forward and come back. Philippians 3.3. 3, For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. And remember I said we are the new Israel? See, that's why Paul mentioned these abstract concepts, even in a Roman context there in Philippi. He says, the ones who live by the Spirit of God, those are the ones who are truly circumcised. He's referring to the fact that we're new Israel. Romans 4.13, by the way, I just want to say this in case you doubt. The original land promise given to Abraham in the Abrahamic covenant was, as I said, from Egypt to the Euphrates. And what do do we read in Romans 4.13? Really briefly, you might want to jot the reference down. Clearly, God's promise to give the what to Abraham? The whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. The land promise that was given to Israel, we have that same land promise. And what we find out through the rest of Scripture is that land is not just from Egypt to the Euphrates, it's the entire universe. I keep saying that because it's crucial. One day, God's presence will completely fill, not just the Holy of Holies in that temple, that tabernacle, God's presence will completely fill the entire universe as it did in that Holy of Holies. Who writes stuff like this? The tapestry of Scripture, this storyline, to me it's it's completely otherworldly and it's supernatural. People couldn't come up with this stuff. Of all the other literature I've read, nothing comes close to the intricacy and the detail, the elaborate detail of the scripture. It's a, such a beautiful story. It's the greatest story ever told by far. If you want to jot down a reference, I don't have time to get into it. Matthew 21, 43. Matthew 21, 43. Got to keep moving. Philippians 2, 2. As we keep moving through Philippians. Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You say, okay, that's just a list of moral code. You know, that's just a list of commands. But that gets back to the mission of the church, which is the church is the sign and the symbol of the new covenant and the new creation. The church is a sign that a here, listen to this, hear this. The church is a sign that a new way of living or being human has been launched into the world. Can I say that again? The church is a sign that a new way of living or being human has been launched into the world. The church, as I said last week, the church through unity, holiness, and suffering are to be the sign showing the lordship of Jesus at work. That is why Paul mentions in Philippians 2, 2, that we're supposed to, uh, in in 3, to not be selfish, to to esteem others higher than ourselves, to be humble, to be gentle. Because it, it, if we're not those things, how are we living out what it means to be the people of God? How are we the new Israel? We're, if we're without those things, we're just like the, the grumbling, complaining people of Israel that wandered around the wilderness for 40 years, are we not? Don't look out for your only, uh, only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Philippians 2.12, work hard as I already mentioned this one, to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Do you see what that, so, so, so many implications in that passage. He's talking about the new covenant. He's talking about the fact that we have the Holy Spirit as members of this new gospel community like the Israelites didn't all have. Some of them did. There was a remnant Perhaps when Elijah said, I'm the last one, God says, I've kept 7,000. There were 7,000 there that had the Spirit. Not exactly the way that we have it in the church age. I don't have time to get into that now. You can talk to me later if you want to understand that theologically. He says in Philippians 2.14, keep moving forward. Do everything without complaining and arguing. What is that reminiscent of? 
Again, he keeps having these indirect allusions back to the children of Israel. Didn't they do a lot of things with grumbling and complaining? He says it more explicitly in 1 Corinthians 10, 10. And don't grumble as some of them did and then were destroyed by the angel of death. These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. Can you imagine God's own people? He sent an angel of death too because of their grumbling and complaining. His own people, he opened up the earth and they were swallowed in Hades. Does is God show partiality? The thing is, he looks. At, <clears throat> the question is, does one really have the Spirit? That's the guarantee. Because a church can go through the motions, go through the mechanics without the Holy Spirit of God. Because he's already said in Philippians, the work he's begun in, begun in you, he is faithful to bring it to completion. Amen. No, he doesn't lose any of his sheep, does he? So the question becomes, we take those concepts in mind, the, the, it boils down to is, he doesn't lose any of his own, but really, who are his own? Because we can have a Christian veneer, but we live like the world. And that's why Paul does warn us about that in Philippians. Philippians 4.2, now I appeal to Judea and Syntyche, please, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. See, that's another facet of living out as citizens of heaven. We, we, because of our mission, we have to work out conflicts with each other. We can't hold on to grudges and bitterness because as soon as we do that, we're off track from our mission. You know what? I, I need to forgive you. Uh, as much as you hurt me, I need to forgive you because I, I, can't, I don't have time for unresolved conflict. We got a mission, don't we? And if we, I mean, the, the stereotypical church where you walk in and you feel tension because there's no spirit there. They're not living as citizens of heaven. Can that, we have to be vigilant on a week-to-week basis that we don't let unresolved conflict creep into our church. If God is doing the work right now, and we just say, oh, we've arrived, can we let unresolved conflict and bitterness destroy this place and the candlestick be removed? That's why Paul challenges these two ladies. And believe me, these were gospel ladies. They were given the gospel, helping Paul in major ways. Work it out. Settle your disagreement because you belong to the Lord. This disagreement matters to you, but let something else matter much more to you, the fact that you belong to him. I don't need your acceptance. I'm not desperate for it because I have his acceptance. And because if I have his acceptance, I can embrace you even while you're stabbing me. If that be the case. But I can still love you well because I'm able to love my enemies because I was an enemy of God. Philippians 4.4, 4, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. And that's why he said in Philippians 2, 15, um, live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in the world, full of crooked and perverse people. If we do the Christian life in isolation outside of community, are people going to see anything? So, I guess I'm going to ask you if I can finish this next week because I wanted to say so much more and, and, and show how a fip, uh, in this particular way, uh, Philippians and Ephesians, there's so much overlap. Because right now in the book of Ephesians, we're moving to the second half. We've moved to the second half. And I, I'm afraid that if we don't finish this, you're going to see that as just a, a moral code. But I want you to see it as so much more. And if you want a precursor for next week, the purpose statement for the mission of the church is answered in Ephesians is Ephesians 3.10. Ephesians 3.10. So I will need to continue this next week. Uh, so let me conclude. The mission of the church is to live as citizens of heaven in gospel community through every interaction, and in doing this we shine like lights. The mission of the church is to live as citizens of heaven and gospel community. So, I, I just, I, it's, it's such a simple concept that I'm, I struggle with simple concepts sometimes in explaining them. 
but I don't, here, here, here it is just to condense everything. When you live like a citizen of heaven, it's not just that God's not mad at you. All these little things that he's calling us to do and some big things, that is our mission. Because in doing all these things collectively, we shine like lights as citizens of heaven. Can you take comfort and, and joy and encouragement in that? Because if we think that the, 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 the mission of the church is merely to proclaim the gospel, some of you don't have a lot of boldness. And some of you are not great at interacting with strangers. And you walk around feeling discouraged all the time. Like I'm not really a, one of those you know, Christian, the super Christians who just preach the gospel and see hundreds saved everywhere they go. Oh, I went to that restaurant. I didn't leave that gospel tract. I didn't give the gospel to the waitress, right? I want you to see there's, there may be many more ways where you are directly fulfilling the mission of the church and bringing praise and glory to God than you realize, so I want you to take encouragement from this and realize those things that you may think are insignificant are hugely important to God. Hugely important to God. <coughs> it's living out as the people. Our lives should be so distinct. We're like, when we navigate out there in the community in the world, people are like, who is this person? What values motivate this person? And in conclusion, I want to say this. To live like a citizen of heaven, you know what that really means? Another way to say everything we've said is one simple statement. To live like a citizen of heaven means investing in other people. Investing in other people. That's the primary thing that a citizen of heaven does. Where do you get that, Timothy? 1 Thessalonians 2.19, Paul says it very succinctly. After all, what gives us hope and joy and what will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before our Lord Jesus when he returns? What will be our crown? Well, a gold crown with rubies and diamonds and sapphires and emeralds. Is that what he's saying? What will be our crown when we stand before our Lord Jesus when he returns? It is you. It's you. Yes, you are our pride and joy. A citizen of heaven invests in other people, and they become the crown. You look around, Paul says, I got my crown with me. You know, Paul talks sometimes about running in vain. You know what Paul's greatest fear oftentimes is? It wasn't death in prison. His, his concern was that he would hear that some of the churches he'd planted, that they'd fallen off the gr grid or gone apostate. He writes things like, oh, when I got that letter back while I was in prison, I was so glad to hear that you were still continuing on in the work of the Lord. He didn't want to lose his crown. That is, he wanted fruit for his labor because he was continually investing in other people. He says, I'd rather go to heaven right now, but I'm staying here because I know the Lord has work for me to do, investing in you. You cannot be a citizen of heaven if you're not working towards investing in other people. That's why I say it says citizens, not citizen. And you can't do life alone. You can't do the Christian life alone without having a gospel community behind you. We don't need a big budget. We don't need a fancy building or expensive music equipment to live out the mission of God. But you know what we do need? You know what I need? What'd you say? Exactly. Exactly. We don't need a big budget, a fancy building, expensive music equipment to live out the mission of God. You know what we need? We need each other. Do we have each other? So what's stopping us? I think sometimes we're looking for God's blessing, but we're looking in the wrong places. You think if we only had this, as I said this week, if we only had this, this, and this, then we could be the church, then we could be awesome. What we need is each other. What I need is you. I need people to invest in. You need people to invest in. We need people to help us shoulder to shoulder to invest in each other. Nothing's stopping us from the mission God has called us to. What we need is the church. Amen. You can't do any of this without the church. The church which he purchased with his own blood. And I can't do the mission without gospel community, so why do American Christians so often treat the church like it's optional? It's optional. 
we want God's blessing, perhaps we've been looking for it in the wrong places. I believe to the degree that we live out the mission as the people of God now, with the resources each of us has now, that God will bless us so we can do more of what we've already been doing. Can we sing here in a moment like citizens of heaven? Can we sing like citizens? Can we sing like we believe it? I'm about ready to. I'm excited. Hey, if you're not a citizen of heaven, today could be the day that you become a citizen of heaven. If you have unconfessed sin in your life, something that doesn't look like a citizen of heaven, you can confess it today and find forgiveness today. I want you to think about what are the next steps for you to live out what it means to be a citizen of heaven, to step out in faith. Maybe it's you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus for the first time. Maybe it's you need to become dedicated to uh, the gospel community, to the church. Maybe it's you need to get some unresolved conflict right in your life with someone that you've hold, held on to bitterness with. Whatever it is, don't let it hold you back. There's forgiveness in the gospel built in, embedded deeply in it. I want to pray for God's blessing. If there's anybody here who's not for sure, certain that they're a Christian, they've not yet put their full trust their full faith in Jesus and Jesus alone, I want you to come see me after worship. I want to pray a blessing for you. Father, thank you that we have the opportunity to live as citizens of heaven. Lord, thank you that there's nothing stopping us from living out and fulfilling the mission you've given to us. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would give us insight into fully understanding what this means in our own lives. Lord, I pray that you would convict us of places where we are just walking in darkness. Lord, I pray that you would remind us before we step into any situation and circumstance this week that we would say, hey, how do I live as a citizen of heaven? I want to work out what it means to live as a citizen of heaven in this context and in this scenario and in this uh, situation. Lord, I want to ask forgiveness on behalf of myself and your people. If there's anything that's in our lives that is grieving your Holy Spirit, I want to ask forgiveness. I want to intercede on behalf of this church and plead the blood of Jesus Christ as our only righteousness, whereby we are able to enter boldly the throne of grace. And Lord, I pray that people would go home here forgiven and rejoicing in that forgiveness. And Lord, I pray we would sing out even now as a redeemed, called out people of God. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.